All right, it's another film study, kind of. It's expanded film study, video film study. Ken McCusick, how are you doing? Life's good, Josh. How about you? I'm all good. I'm glad we're putting out video content because people are stuck in their houses. They're not driving around their cars listening. They are sitting at their computers or TVs, holding onto their phones. Uh, anything to pass the time right now, I believe. I'm hearing that. I'm hearing the, the Atlanta Falcons had 10 times as much video watched in the month of February or March. I don't remember which one it was uh, as the previous year. So we're looking for good numbers, right? Oh, yes. And you know what? Podcast numbers, I saw, I read today, podcast numbers are down during this lockdown because people are not in offices and they're not commuting. Oh. And those are huge yeah. podcast numbers are when people are driving on public transportation or when they're in uh, the office and just don't want to hear all of the other coworkers. So now gotcha. that people are home, you're watching TV, you're watching Netflix, you're doing all this other stuff and pretending to work. Hopefully, we'll give them a little bit of eye candy and, uh, and make, a, make a count as we go through this at how many times we touch our faces and do the wrong thing for coronavirus. Oh, I, we're all in our houses. So uh, I believe <laughs> Joe Biden said I can sneeze however I want as long as I'm in my own house. Interesting, interesting. So, or cough. Interesting I think ideas. he coughed is what he, he mentioned. Uh, joining us also on the third uh, Brady Bunch box is Dan Rees. Dan, how are you doing? Pretty good. Thanks, guys. It's great to have you, Dan. I uh, got to know you a little bit on Twitter over the last year or so and talking back and forth about a lot of football, always a high-level discussion. And then I figured out why. You're, you're an actuary also. Yep, pension actuary. <laughs> so a lot in common on that. Recently been uh, getting into the sports analytics stuff, so really been trying to, <laughs> trying to broaden my skills in that area. All right. Well, very cool, Dan. We appreciate you uh, doing what you do. Uh, Twitter handle, go ahead and give it to him now. We'll probably hit it again at the end while we're at it, too. Sure. It's uh, DP Reese. That's R E E S. And then the number eight. So DP Reese eight. All right. Highly recommend him as a follow and make sure you get in on some good discussion that way. There's a lot of good back and forth. Um, Derek Wolf, obviously just recently acquired. Now he's passed the physical with the Ravens. How excited are you? I'm, I'm very excited. I think it's a, you know, good, good fit. Um, a good replacement after Brockers deal fell through. I think it's a, you know, it's a good um, one year, 3 million up to $6 million deal. So a little bit cheaper uh, than Brockers gives us some versatility on the cap. And uh, I think it'll also help with uh, shifting around the comp picks. I think uh, last thing I was reading was, we should, it should cancel with more and give us uh, the, the fifth round for Pierce. So that's, that's pretty great as well. Yeah. Fifth or maybe even the fourth for Pierce, but maybe I, depending on who you heard it from, if you heard it from Brian McFarland, I agree. It's probably, a, it's probably a fifth and that's a shame. Now, weren't you excited that the Ravens are finally taking a lesson out of the Orioles playbook in making a deal with someone and backing off with physicals? I think, you know, the Ravens had done it before with a wide receiver two seasons ago. So it's something in the NFL, you really don't want to get a bad reputation for doing. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, it's important to, to not do it. But apparently there was an unreconcilable issue with the physical from, from Brockers. And I'm not exactly sure what it was. They tried to work it out. It didn't, it didn't work out. And they, uh, they had to move on. Brockers got a very similar deal from the Rams. So at least he didn't, he didn't get hosted the deal too bad. Right. All right, now we're going to do a separate podcast for that later this week. But today, Ken, why don't you put up the big head in, the big slideshow, and we're going to get into uh, what's the defense, breaking down the defense of the 2019 Ravens. That's, that's exactly what we're here to do. Okay, so the idea behind this is identifying the Ravens packages from your seat. And I'm doing exactly what you should do. I'm reading the slide to you, which I promise not to do for this whole episode, because most of these slides don't have words on them. They have actual pictures of the defense. So we're, we're going to try and help you from your seat, whether that's at home or at the ballpark, identify that defense very quickly uh, by being able to use some special tricks uh, uh, that we give you and also just to, to quickly know what the choices kind of are that the Ravens use regularly uh, in terms of defensive packaging. Mostly what I'm talking about here is packages. We will occasionally stray into some schematic elements and some flexibility given by certain packages. But most of all, we're talking about what defensive personnel, what 11 guys 
go on the field and how they, those 11 most typically line up. But we're not talking about man or zone defense. We might stray into that peripherally, but that's not the, it's not the general topic of this uh, or, or other uh, schematic components. So as we do this, I, 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 sure I'll make some mistakes and, and Dan will correct me. And he says, I know a lot of questions as we go through package by package. But I'm just going to jump into the first general topic right here, which is that in, in the NFL, well, let's make sure this, I can get this done. There we go. Okay. Um, the base package is often something I've asked about. And what is the base package? And in the NFL, honestly, there are now two packages which take up uh, the majority of first down snaps. And that is you either have um, a base package, which is the three, four, four, three down linemen, four total linebackers, two of them outside linebackers who are at the line of scrimmage, plus two inside linebackers, and four defensive backs. Um, that's, that's one of the typical, that's, that's the base package as we would call it. Um, if if the, the other base package is when the offense puts three wide receivers on the field, um, they really dictate that the defense must put five defensive backs and specifically three cornerbacks on the field. They, they're, they're known as forcing the nickel. Um, they often will do that even on first down because a lot of offensive coordinators really like to scheme to run against a smaller set of defenders as opposed to putting in one extra heavy offensive player, be that a tight end or fullback, to try and uh, execute their own run concepts. The Ravens go the other direction, but most teams um, do use a 11 personnel, as it's called, which means one running back and one tight end uh, to, to run most of their basic offensive packages. Okay, so anyway, important concept is that a lot of times it's the offense that chooses what defense the Ravens play. There are down and distance components to it, but uh, but uh, it's, it's a lot driven by exactly what the offense is doing. Dan, jump in any time here. I'll just leave that at that, and we're going to take a look at the base defense whenever you're ready. Yeah, I think let's get right into it. All right. Well, fantastic. So we've got a few things to show you on this. This is the base defense. And uh, by the way, I do not see my talking head box up there, Josh. Any reason why that might not be happening? No biggie. We'll continue on if, if, uh, if we see a reason for this or there, there's a reason why this is happening. I'm sure we'll catch this later. Very technically uh, uh, naive here, at least on my end. Josh is not. Uh, and, and I'm learning on the fly here. But this is the base defense. San Francisco 49ers game was an interesting one because the Ravens really had not played very much base defense the whole season. In fact, they've only been in the, in the base defense 33 times in the first three months of the season from, from September to November. But the December 1st game, against the 49ers because the 49ers have very heavy personnel and you'll see not only do they have a good offensive line these five guys but they also have Kittle at tight end who's a monster and they have Juszczyk who's a fullback they like to have on the field lined up a lot of different places that they will motion in and use in blocking schemes actually very similar to the Ravens almost like the Ravens were playing themselves uh, in this game so anyway the uh, this this base uh, off base defense has three down linemen. You see them here. That's Williams over here. That's Pierce. And this is, I think it's Wormley, but I'm not 100% sure about that. And then two outside linebackers, Judon over here, and this is Ferguson up here. And then you have uh, two inside linebackers, and that is Bynes and Awaso. And then you have four uh, defensive backs here. And this is just one thing I want to point out. If you're doing analysis of defense, or if you're trying to understand what defense they're in even, think of it as two separate parts. You've got the core players or set pieces, and those are these seven guys here. Uh, it can be fewer, it can be, can be six, or it can be five, it can even be four. But anyway, the, the, the guys who are here, the set pieces, um, are the linebackers and defensive linemen, and then this umbrella is the defensive backs. So that's usually how I look at it first. Now you can get confused a little sometimes there can be other defensive backs in other positions, but most commonly, if you look at that and it's a standard kind of a first down formation, that's where you'll see the players are. Yes. Yeah, so you had uh, you had mentioned that it's uh, three down linemen and then the four linebackers. So the two outside linebackers are are on the line of scrimmage. Is that pretty much always the case in a a, a three four alignment? 
Yeah, I'd say it is. Um, on first down in particular, they always line up five and two like this. So you don't have anybody lined up off the line of scrimmage. If you did, it would be something really unusual, maybe on a second and long play to try and get some advantage. Like I know the Ravens lined up Haloti Nada off the line of scrimmage occasionally. Last year, they lined up Matthew Judon on some third down plays kind of at an inside linebacker spot, kind of a shallow in the middle of the field so that he could take a different stunting route in various directions. And they, they were successful with that. So that might be something we see again. But yes, generally speaking, your outside linebackers at the line of scrimmage on the edge, they have a very important role to play, of course, in run defense that they need to set that edge um, and try and make it so that that play is pushed back to the inside uh, where you have five guys, hopefully very capable of taking care of the tackle. So these edge setters are, are important. And frankly, the edge setters on the Ravens didn't play that well last year. And are the two, uh, the two edge outside linebackers the same or are they, uh, are they two different positions? Okay, that's a good point. So you have a, you have a Sam linebacker and a Rush linebacker. We'll go briefly to what the difference is here. This is Judon over here. He's a Sam linebacker and he'll, he'll line up most typically, if not always, on the same side where, the, where they have a tight end. So here he's lined up opposite Kittle or on the same side as Kittle. Um, the idea is he could take some coverage responsibilities. So a Sam linebacker is typically a better cover linebacker than your rush linebacker. And that's Ferguson in this case. He'll typically line up opposite a naked tackle. So for many years, that was Terrell Suggs. And even though Suggs would occasionally drop the cover, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't all that common. And most of the time, he was trying to set the edge against a tackle, uh, which is a little more challenging component of run defense probably but a less challenging component in terms of any kind of coverage responsibility okay okay great. go ahead i was just gonna say uh did you want to talk about the different d-line positions too or yeah we can we can do that so you want to talk text is, is what you really mean yeah. by that okay so let's talk about that now because i think this is a good time to to do it but um you you're you'll often hear the term zero tech three tech five tech one tech kind of thing. Let me, let me kind of explain how it works. I, I want to go from first principles here. The center is the starting point of any counting mechanism you use. And if you're lined up directly over center, helmet on helmet, like Pierce is here, that's a zero tech or nose tackle position. Okay. Now for each position you move out, counting by offensive linemen, you're moving two techs out. So if you're lined up directly over guard, which nobody is in this picture, then you're a two tech. If you line up directly over the tackle, you're a four tech. And if you line up between the spots as say, uh, this is Brandon Williams here, he's lining up in a three tech spot because he's between the guard and the tackle. All right, now one thing, there are subtle distinctions made sometimes. This is Chris Wormley over here is lined up to the inside of Brunskill, the left tackle here. He's at, since his helmet is to the inside of that guy, that's often referred to as a four I as opposed to a three. Uh, so that's some a, a subtle distinction people make. Um, if you're lined up directly on the tight end shoulder, you're a seven. In this case, Judon is much further out than, than that. And this would be a nine tech. So you would hear that often said. And, um, and I'll, in this case, this would be, uh, Ferguson lined up as a probably a seven tech is the way I'd call it, but they might call it a nine also just because it's it's fairly wide of the line of scrimmage. He's not lined up on top of a on top of a tight end. Uh, one of the points that you know we'll we'll hear come up, and this is probably more more applicable to the jumbo nickel, is having a little bit wider line of scrimmage allows your outside linebackers a little bit more favorable matchup in terms of their ability to turn a run play back to the to the inside. Uh, so that's something that the offense, sorry, defenses seek to do a lot. Is is that clear? Or was there maybe something else I'm missing? Yeah, no, I think that I think that makes sense. I think uh, you know you hear a lot of, uh, especially with the acquisitions, you hear a lot of, you know, can play three tech and five tech. So mm -hmm. you know that's a you know in between the guard and and, and tackle, um, or between tackle and, and tight end, I guess. So right so a lot of, a lot of people they really they really love to have a penetrating three tech and we, we're talking about Derek Wolf a little bit um, he's a little smallish to play that position where you're between a guard and a tackle so mm -hmm. he would he would be in a better position to play on the outside shoulder of a tackle where he'd be really a five tech now the circumstances are what they are and Wolf is going to play a lot of three tech I'm sure in this defense uh, where he lines up on the inside and one of the reasons is you have to space out your linemen across the line of scrimmage 
And when you have the nickel on, they usually are four apart, if that makes sense. So if I have a one tech lining up right here in this slot, if Pierce wouldn't be Pierce anymore, but if it was Williams lining up at the one tech over here, and Wolf is the guy on the field with him, he's almost certainly going to be right over here as a three tech, just because that's the way the spacing of four players works to, uh, to get your guys lined up so that, so that there isn't a big gaping hole anywhere. Yep. Yep. And I think we'll see that later on when we, when we see those uh, formations. Nickel. Yep. Sure. Sure. Let's move on here. Perfect. Uh, okay. Now we're going to go on to uh, what is actually a more common defense. And we have another resource here. I kind of want to bring that up right now while we have a shot at it is how many times they played these defenses. So let's, let's first of all, look at the, uh, base defense, which is here. And you can see it's it's the base defense, but they only played it 102 times on the year. So that was 10.6. And we still got the, uh, sorry to interrupt, we still got the, uh, the picture, um, your PowerPoint's on the screen right now. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can, if I can change that somehow. Hmm. Just change your screen, Sharon, so that you are sharing your screen and not your PowerPoint presentation. When you go to screen share, you can choose the app or the screen, you want to share the entire screen. Not sure how to get back to it at this point. This is All interesting. Right. Well, we'll see we'll if I... There you go. Now you're good. Ad. Now go to your. No, no, I'm, I'm on the slideshow now, but I'm not. Oh, here it is. Now stop share. Stop share. Yep. Okay. And now share screen, but do something specific with it. Yep. Share screen, screen. and don't choose the, choose just the desktop or the screen. Okay. Very good. All right, you'd think I'd, I'd learn how to do this at some point, but I do appreciate having there you guys you on the show and, and doing that. So now I'm back in, the, back in this, but I can also should be able to go to my Excel spreadsheet and talk about that. Can you guys see that now? Yep. Perfect. Yep. You're all good now. Fantastic. Okay, we don't have to do editing there. They can see how much of a nimrod I am in terms of this. <laughs> uh -huh. um, okay, so 10.6% of the time they play the, the base package, and that's 102 times. This is a, a kind of a cool point. The Ravens had very few total defensive snaps last year. Now, my number is lower than other published sources because I take out the penalties, but this number matches with the total snaps per game that you'll see in a typical game book um, with the team totals. And that 964, if I divide, and, and the only thing that should be missing from there are kneels and spikes and special teams plays resulting in a run or pass. But if you take 964 and you divide that by 17 games, the Ravens played only 56.7 defensive snaps per game. And that's about seven or seven and a half less than the league average this year. So that's really terrific. That means they were really dominating uh, in terms of snap count pretty much throughout the year. And, uh, and you can see they only gave up 70 snaps once. That was to Cincinnati in week 10 in a game they won very handily. So um, they, they didn't really have a big problem with, uh, with anybody out snapping them or, or uh, really wearing them down defensively would be, uh, you know, important consideration. So anyway, base package 10.6% of the time. We go to the standard nickel now, 32.7% of the time. So they play the standard nickel three times as often as they play that base package. And uh, as you can see, it was a major component of all the games. As the season went on, you can see a few less standard nickels being played because they, they played another version of the nickel we're going to get to a little later called the jumbo nickel that really took over a fair amount of those, of those nickel packages. Let's go back to the, to the pictures for a moment and just explain what are they doing in the nickel and how does that work? What are they trying to accomplish with this? We start off with you only have four guys on the line of scrimmage here. You have two uh, inside linebackers. This one is a little bit strange, and I, I, I told you, look at the umbrella, but this is a play where Carr here, number 24 early in the season, this is week five, before the acquisition of Peters, is lined up opposite a Pittsburgh bunch formation here. So they have to align themselves a little bit differently than they normally would, and you've got the rest of the umbrella lined up back here, as you can see. So if there's five defensive backs on the field, and there's these five, six, I'm sorry, set pieces who are uh, ready to play the run and to make sure this play gets turned inside properly. Um, and, and also to rush the passer, obviously, if it's a, if it's a pass play. So uh, what I want to say about the standard nickel that, was, that is all just so important here. One of the things, if you're in your seat and you want to know how, what did they just change to, watch substitutions. 
because oftentimes from first to second down, a very common change is to go from your base package, standard three, four, and then go to the, uh, uh, sorry about that, go to the nickel, and all you do is substitute one defensive tackle going out, or it can be the nose tackle, and one cornerback, usually a slot corner, coming on the field. So typically it might be Tavon coming on for, for Williams might be a typical one, or Tavon coming on for, for uh, maybe Campbell this next year, who knows. So it'll be a, a, a single change of that type. And when you see that, you know, oh, they're going from base to nickel. And if you want to be the smart guy in your row of fans and whatnot, oh, they move from, you know, base to nickel, then you'll <laughs> be able to do that. And uh, without any kind of thought about that, you don't often can't watch those substitutions when you're, when you're on TV, uh, but you can usually catch them when you're at the game. Let's see anything else about this we want to talk about. Uh, I do want to say this. The Ravens, for their entire history, generally speaking, have had a tremendous ability to stop the run with only six guys in the box, namely this, this, the six set pieces here I'm talking about. They always had great players at all three of these positional groups. So not only did they have great inside uh, uh, defensive linemen, which I think you know, people remember Adams and Siragusa, they certainly remember Haloti Nada and what Kelly Gregg did for them on the inside in terms of being a very productive tackler. Um, Williams and Pierce are no step down from any of those guys. So they, they were just as good there in 2019 as they've really ever been. The problem was on the edge and an inside linebacker where, the, where they didn't have as good personnel, particularly early in the season. But uh, they had uh, two guys here. It's actually McPhee over here and Judon are an outside linebacker. Um, and each is a step down from having a generational player like Suggs. Uh, a lot of people know him as a, as a good pass rusher, but he was the greatest pass rusher, a uh, greatest run defender of his generation at outside linebacker. And, and honestly really should make the hall of fame just for that. Although, you know, 140 sacks or whatever he's ended up with is, uh, is not going to hurt. Uh, and then they, the two inside linebackers are, are a place where the Ravens really struggled in 2019 to a point where they would even give up having one of them on the field. Um, at a certain point. And, uh, you know, part of the story and the story we want to tell today is the Ravens completely changed their defensive approach as the year went on, very much swapped out a lot of players, had one of the most extremely successful changes in personnel as in season that I've ever seen by getting two new inside linebackers they could trust in Bynes and Fort by you know, picking up Marcus Peters, of course, by picking up two big defensive linemen that really helped them, by picking up Ward, uh, you know, pretty much was a response to the loss of McPhee, although I, think, I believe it came before him, uh, but it allowed them to, re to respond uh, to the loss of McPhee. Uh, you know, they were able to respond to the loss of Jefferson by not only putting Clark in, uh, in his place and not missing a beat, but also have Clark take over the signal calling responsibilities that gave them all sorts of flexibility. So ton of changes in the 2019 Ravens as the season went on. And we kind of want to tell that story as we go through um, with this. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, I, I think one of the challenges during 2019 that you can see here is uh, for a, in the nickel package was a lot of times Humphrey had to shift to be the nickel back because Tavon was out. So uh, that was one of the challenges that, uh, that the Ravens had to face all of 2019 was trying to find um, a good replacement for the nickelback, whether it was, I think Carr played it for a little bit and then uh, Humphrey played it for, for majority of the season. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. We have Carr inside here. So he it's, it's lost a little bit who the nickelback is against this bunch formation, the Steelers run, but mm -hmm. this is Humphrey on the outside and this is Kennedy on the outside. Uh, so you, you, you're looking at a, you know, a, a position where the Ravens don't have exactly the guy they wanted from the start of the season. They wanted Tavon there. Um, the Ravens don't really have a backup there. Tavon's coming back from his second injury, and it's actually a little bit concerning to me that he won't uh, uh, you know, be the same player anymore. Yeah, it'll be interesting and see if they uh, address that at all in the, in the draft. So. Yeah, it would be, it'd yeah. be a good position to draft late, maybe get a special teamer who can also – play a little slot corner. There are a lot of those guys later on, they tend to be smaller corners, uh, but look for those good change of direction skills and look for the Ravens to probably pick one up. So you'd mentioned that it's kind of a little bit lost with this, you know, uh, with, the, with the three wide receivers all on the same side. Um, 
normally it would be you know two wide receivers on one side one on the other side and the the nickel uh the nickel back would cover the the slot wide receiver right that's right the okay. nickel back would be on top of the inside receiver yeah probably you know, we could have definitely done a different um a different version of that to to kind of see that but that would be the normal way yeah okay cool and almost almost every three wide receiver set in Ravens history that I can remember where the three were split, as you're mentioning, not bunched, has always been one corner on top of each of those three. Uh, you know, I, I, there was an interesting play from a few years ago where um, Elam got accused of messing up a touchdown pass to Hogan in, in a game against New England. Uh, but the fact of the matter was Webb was looking backwards and forgot to follow Hogan from one side of the field to the other. And uh, and kind of a bad situation there, but, uh, but anyway, that's a you do always. It's something you should look for if you don't have a corner on each of those receivers. Either the Ravens are doing something new, or they did something wrong. One of those two. So uh, <laughs> either possibility. Right, let's move on here. I got another view of this uh, in terms of just how people are lined up. You can see a little bit of what I was talking about before about the four um, uh, spot. We'll call it. Uh, widening here uh, yep. that you've you've got a uh, you know you've got to space your guys out across the line of scrimmage fairly evenly in order to uh, to have that make sense. So let's go a little further with that. Okay, we move on to another package not used that often, but the Ravens used it some in the at the beginning of the season, in particular the big nickel. So this is a case where uh, usually where another team is either a very strong running team with kind of modest receivers or a, or a modest quarterback, which is not the case here against Kansas City, uh, or they're using two tight ends and one running back, and one of those tight ends might split wide. That's Travis Kelsey to a T. He, he's a kind of a wide receiver um, who, who sometimes lines up in line, but more often will, will line up like Andrews does, uh, split from the formation to try and get a good release from the line of scrimmage. and, and uh, run a wider set of routes that might be available to him there. But anyway, uh, Chuck Clark, in this case, is the big nickel. So the Ravens have five defensive backs on the field. They have three safeties instead of three corners in this formation. So they, they've lined up Clark here, actually opposite Bell. This, this pass actually, this play actually went to Bell for a one-yard pass, and Clark made the tackle. But uh, if, if Kelsey had been split wide, then Clark would have been covering him on the play and Bell would have been treated effectively like a, like an inline player and would have had to been covered by a linebacker or by strong safety or whatever. So uh, it's uh, just another way to get kind of two and a half cornerbacks on the field, get a little bit better run preparedness, obviously Clark, a, a fairly physical player, as we noticed in 2019 and as a player who can really help you stop the run. So, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a bigger version of the nickel that allows you a better chance to stop the run. Yeah. One thing um, that you'll notice by looking at the, uh, the counts though, is that um, they really kind of went away from this after, um, after week, week six, they didn't play it again. And I think mm -hmm. there's a couple of reasons um, likely for that. Uh, some, I think you had mentioned with the run defense and, um, needing, needing some support due to the inside linebackers. But another one was uh, due to the loss of some of the safeties, uh, with a couple injuries, both Jefferson and Elliott uh, got injured in those first six weeks. So kind of depleted the, uh, some of the safety core. And I think that kind of impacted some of the, the opportunity to kind of play three safeties. So. Yeah, it's worth talking about exactly how this evolved here. So, Week four, a very pivotal week for the Ravens because that, that week they moved the green dot to Tony Jefferson from Owasso. Owasso had been having a lot of problems the first three weeks. He didn't play badly against Miami. I thought he played pretty well that game, but a lot of problems the next two weeks, both in coverage and in terms of being a little bit smallish and being caught up in, in the run. Uh, you know, there was a guy they took a chance on, moving him to middle linebacker, giving him the green dot. He was a terrific platoon weak side linebacker in 2018 but in 2019 they just asked him to do a little much it's kind of like the peter principle of uh, uh management you know you get promoted to one spot higher than you should really ever be promoted to but uh in any case they made the change in week four 
And that allowed them to take Owasso off the field for a few snaps, but that flexibility became much more valuable as the year went on. Um, Jefferson was injured that week or against Pittsburgh. I'm forgetting which. I believe against Pittsburgh. And then against Pittsburgh, Clark first took off over the dot, I believe, in the fourth quarter of that game. And so for the remainder of that, there wasn't really even an opportunity to play any of this big nickel because Clark would have been the guy they would have wanted there. They could have had Elliott there too, I suppose, but Clark would have been the guy that would have been the more natural fit. And they just had to uh, go on with using Clark in one of two spots uh, that we'll get to in, later in, in some of the packages. But even, even used in a fairly limited matter for four weeks, Martindale was leaning on that, on that package pretty heavily to play 4.7%. I mean, it, you, project that out to a full season you'd be close to 20 percent of the total snaps if they continued at the same rate so or maybe 15 anyway since they did have it available to them for the pittsburgh game yep all right take a look at that we we haven't talked about this yet but this is probably a good time to toss it in there go out and get game pass right now nfl game pass because it's free okay it, you're really missing an opportunity if you don't. And I, and I, so I hope as many people who regularly listen to the podcast or regularly come to the to film study Baltimore will do it. Um, it's, it's been offered free, I think through May, uh, might even be through later than that. And uh, you can watch old football games. So you have that advantage while you're home and, and alone, or you can uh, uh, watch old coaches film. And there's two forms of coaches film. I want to make people aware of you have, this, which is called the top view, it's often referred to as an all 22, but this is actually one of two coaches views, which is the top view. And this is obviously it's taken from the sideline. And the goal is with this is you're trying to do uh, understand depth better than you understand width of the field. So it's really good for looking at receivers and how the routes they're running, looking at coverage and see how that's uh, developing. You can you catch a lot of the hand play between the receiver and the defensive back. So it's very good for that. And then the other one is called the all 22, which is a little bit of a misnomer in today's wider schemes, because you rarely can see all 22 players in terms of their numbers. But when they're doing a lot of the NFL projects initially to try and make sure they could take advantage of, of finding everybody's number on the field, they use this camera to try and find them usually at the breaking of the huddle to try and count out all the numbers. And if you do any kind of, analysis which involves participation by play like I do finding those numbers and seeing them is just a very big deal so you want high def you want good sunlight you want uniforms that are not confusing I don't even think I'd be doing this if I was a fan of the Miami Dolphins it's just it's miserable trying to read their uniform numbers the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who have those squared off numbers just un unreadable <laughs> in terms of this so uh, it's really nice to have a team like the Ravens that, that has nice uh, uniforms that are very readable, particularly when they're when they're uh, when they're in the black on white here. Except for the color rush, the color rush is really hard to see. I think it's a, it's a little bit harder. You're right. Uh, it's it's definitely the hardest of the uniform colors that they <laughs> that they wear. That's for sure. So, all right, big nickel. We we got through that. We're going to talk a little bit about one of the packages that became much more prevalent in 2019, and that's the jumbo nickel. So. Uh, okay, we, we, we go through the year a lot, and, we're, and we're, I think most everybody watching this, listening to this, will be familiar that there were, there were a lot of problems stopping the run for the 2000 Ravens, and particularly stopping the run with some form of the nickel on the field, the 2019 Ravens. And so the Ravens tried a, a couple of different things to get better. Uh, they, they changed out their linebackers. They still had problems. They still had problems in particular on the edge at stopping the run. And so one of the ways that they adjusted to it eventually was to say, okay, we need to just take an inside linebacker off the field. I'm pointing to this empty space where Owasso would normally be and instead put in an extra defensive lineman on the line of scrimmage. So you still have five defensive backs looking around the umbrella here. Still have five defensive backs. They haven't sacrificed everything against the pass, but they've put on one additional defensive lineman and taken off an inside linebacker. New set of challenges, obviously, if anyone breaks into level two, but you spread the line of scrimmage to make it a little bit easier for your edge defenders to contain that edge. We talked about that a little bit earlier. They may get a little bit better matchup. It's a little bit further to the edge, so they have a little bit more time to set it up and to, and to get that edge turned so the player has to move back to the inside. The downside is you only have one inside linebacker. So if 
they get good blocks up front, and they, they get their double teams worked out. They get into level two. Bynes has got to make that tackle. And then secondarily, your safeties really know how to, need to know how to run fit as well. So they need to be able to come up and make tackles. Unfortunately, having Thomas and Clark, a couple of fairly physical safeties, um, are a good pair to run this uh, with, a, with only a single linebacker. Also, Bynes was simply outstanding last year. So uh, he, he was very good in this, uh, in this particular set. Yeah, so it seems kind of a mix between, uh, you know, pass defense, but trying to protect a little bit more on the on the run side. Is that right? Yeah, you're you're, you're not giving up everything against the pass because you still got the nickel in. You got the extra yep. defensive back to cover that third receiver, but you're also saying we know you like to run out of eleven personnel, so we need to also defend against the run, and we're going gotcha. to do it better than we otherwise would by having a third down lineman. In there. Yep, I think it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, and whether we continue to play this formation in 2020 uh, with the, you know, addition, a lot of additions on the D, D line and not so many yet, at least on the inside linebacker position. So we'll see, we'll see how that plays out in 2020. Yeah, I, I think that will be interesting because, you know, I'm of the opinion, well, well, we'll go through this some more later, but there is a real question as to whether how much the Ravens need a single stud linebacker or whether they would prefer to platoon at these positions. So we'll talk about that a little more as we go. But uh, mm -hmm. Bynes and Fort, in terms of their individual uh, contributions to the 2019 Ravens, were terrific. It wasn't an inside linebacker that the Ravens suffered from weeks five plus. Uh, those guys were great. And, uh, and so got to hats off to them. I, don't, I still don't know what the Bengals paid Bynes in terms of his, uh, what, his, what his new contract is. But uh, I think they probably got, ended up getting a bargain for him uh, uh, at whatever price they paid because he, he can really do it. Yeah, um, I was surprised but didn't get signed. Yeah, me too. Well, yeah. If, you, if, you're, if you're Bynes, he, he already did. I mean, his strange case is, you know, he made the game-saving tackle in the Super Bowl. Not only – he has a ring, obviously. Never had – he hasn't gotten another one since with Arizona. But – it, it, you'd think that a player like that might want to come back and get another ring. And if he did, then it would be, uh, you know, the, the 2019 Ravens or 2020 Ravens, I should say, certainly have an excellent chance to do that. And I would have thought he'd want to come back, but uh, for whatever reason, they, they were not able to work it out. I, I, yep. I think they were trying to, to, to uh, negotiate with him, but they just couldn't work it out. But the Ravens at some point may have also decided they wanted to go to the draft and get a linebacker. So, uh, see about that okay so that's the jumbo nickel looking at it from this angle you kind of get a better sense of, of how wide those edge players can be so you see judon is on a tight end over here i think that's ricky seals jones and uh and this is ward over here who's outside the tackle is going to have a better chance to set him up and and get that edge uh set so that chubb can't get to the outside on that side so uh like uh, like this defense, appreciate the Ravens used it. And we'll take a quick look at the other sheet for a second because you can see as they went on through the season, they really leaned on the jumbo nickel to try and fix what were a lot of problems with the standard nickel stopping the run. So they ended up playing it 82 times. That's 73 times over the last, what, nine weeks of the season, including the divisional loss to Tennessee. So they're playing it about eight times per game on average. Uh, for those um, those games, that's not an insignificant amount of time to play any package, but certainly a you know a run first package. That's a that's a lot. So uh, uh, again, you project that out to a full season, they'd be looking at probably fifteen to seventeen percent uh, jumbo nickel if they were if they were committed to that the entire year. Yeah, definitely a, a different package, and it was interesting to see how they went to it. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on here. Now, this is the dime defense, and I tried to pick a representative game for each of these packages as well as uh, just a, a, a good example from, from the uh, picture itself. But this is, this is the dime defense as played against New England in that week nine Sunday night game that effectively, in my mind, kind of was the baton passing of the team in the AFC now. So the, the Patriots obviously have dominated – really the NFL, not just the AFC, but the AFC in particular for the last, what, 20 years. <laughs> but you, you, it's probably that entire period. And they've done it because they've always had the hot coordinators. They've always had the hot head coach. They've always obviously had the hot quarterback. 
And all of that has changed. Now the Ravens have the hot coordinators. I think you, Harbaugh is just one coach of the year, so I think you'd have to, you have to put him in that class uh, as, as being one of the top coaches at least. The Ravens certainly have the hot quarterback in the unanimous MVP. Uh, and this was a great way that this Ravens defense was able to adjust to what the Patriots do. And despite the fact that the, the Patriots, even on the road, are able to play a very fast, no huddle offense, the Ravens adapted very well to it defensively in this game. And they did it with the dime defense primarily. Um, you know, just got a total number of dime snaps they played in this game before we start talking about all that. So they played the standard dime 32 times among 65 snaps. Almost half the game they played dime compared to about 38%, 38.3 for the year as a whole uh, playing dime. So uh, that's some version of it. Uh, so anyway, that, that 32 is a, is a high number. And they played Dan pointed out to me that, that they played a little bit of an odd version of the dime in this game. Normally, the Ravens' dime includes three outside linebackers, one defensive lineman, or even sometimes four outside linebackers playing along the line of scrimmage, known as the race car package, which we'll get to later, um, with only one linebacker. And, uh, and this one is not. This one is one inside linebacker, two down linemen, two outside linebackers, and Clark here in the middle of the field. Why this was really important in this game was this, that against that fast no huddle, very important have centralized communication um, to get the, the complex blitz calls into the game against the Patriots. So they're running to the line of scrimmage. They're there at 18, 19 seconds still left on the play clock, and they're calling their play at the line of scrimmage with their same personnel play after play after play. The Ravens have to do two things. They have to adjust on the fly to the degree they can to make one-on-one -on -one and two-on-two -two substitutions, which they did some of, but they also need to um, uh, make sure that play call gets in from the side. And there, Clark was able to communicate very well to all the players, including the new players coming on the field, what the package was in terms of the, the, the defense, the blitz, the, all of the things that they're, they're running on the defensive side. So he did an outstanding job in this game. And I think this was really the game where, where he came, uh, personally, his coming-of-age game. Uh, for the rest of the season, it then became a question of, are they going to re-sign Clark to a long-term deal to me? But uh, just a terrific single um, effort by him in this game, in particular, to keep that defense organized and to cut down on a lot of the mistakes that had been made in those first four and five weeks of the season in terms of breakdowns and coverage uh, that had been regularly occurring on the back end. So in this formation, you can see the they've got you know the, the six defensive backs with uh, the sixth one being the dime back. Is the dime back normally aligned in the linebacker area there where, uh, where Clark is? Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. and, and you're making a good point about like, the, I always call the dime is the defense, but the dime is also the dime back, the player. And so, uh, you know, the, the Chuck Clark here lined up there is playing the dime back role within this greater thing, the dime defense. Okay, so it's a, that's a good point. And the, what makes it the dime defense is there's six defensive backs on the field. One, two, three, four, five, and six defensive backs on the field. So, uh, yes, that's uh, – uh, and by the way, it, we talked about the text. Why don't we talk about this while we're here? Coinage in the NFL should work exactly as it should. The, the nickel is five defensive backs. The dime is six defensive backs. The quarter is seven defensive backs. The half dollar, if they ever played it, would be eight defensive backs. There is a dollar defense that I've seen in, in various football coaching books, which is nine defensive backs, although they, they, they only a end of half, end of game, bringing in wide receivers to play the position, probably uh, defense that you would play. Uh, and and uh, the funny thing is that four defensive backs is called base. And the terminology, the 335 nickel or the jumbo nickel that we talked about just previously is sometimes referred to, I know the Bears do this, as penny. Now, I don't, I don't think that is a, a common terminology across all NFL teams, but it breaks the rules of coinage, so I won't <laughs> use it. <laughs> so even if the Ravens do call it penny, I, I call it jumbo nickel. This has got five that, backs. It ruins the story <laughs> yes. if you call it that. There you do. And it just confuses people. It's, not, it's unnecessarily <laughs> confusing, so we're going yeah. with jumbo nickel. So you had mentioned that, uh, that, that Chuck Clark has got the green dot for the last two-thirds. Um, you know, and, and we kind of rotated at a couple different positions and before we found someone who, who, who could stick with, uh, who 
what position do most teams have the green dot for? Okay, great question. Because there's only four places that can have the green dot. You can have the green dot at either of two inside linebacker positions or either of two safety positions. And the reason for that is that those player, the player who has the green dot helmet, practic, for practical purposes, has to be on the field for every single play. And also, he has to be not so far away from the play that he possibly can't call it. And so both – you might have some starting cornerbacks who play every play, but if they're, you know, way down the field covering a nine route and they have to come back to call the signals, that wouldn't make any sense. They don't, they don't try and do that. That generally, that same rule often rules a free safety out of doing it, although some teams have that anyway, because a free safety often will have to play on the back end, play a deep cover two or, cut, or a single high, and he'll have more trouble getting up to call that play. Uh, but but some teams still do it with their free safety. It's not uncommon. More common to have a strong safety call it. A lot of a lot of guys in recent years, Jim Leonard with the Jets, uh, with the Bills, briefly with the Ravens in the playoffs, uh, was a guy who called the uh, called the signals. Um, Lynch comes to mind as a guy who who called signals. So there's various strong safeties have have done it. But it's it's very frequently it's an inside linebacker, and when the inside linebacker does it, it kind of cuts down on your flexibility with inside linebackers because the Ravens showed this last year. They'd love to take inside linebackers and move them in and out of the game at will, but you don't have that flexibility if your guy has the green dot. So you have to leave him in the game all the time. And then, you know, that holds you back, particularly in the case of Owasso, it didn't make any sense because he was, he was hurting the team in coverage, hurting the team to have him on the field on third down in particular. And, and that was a place where they, they decided they couldn't live with that anymore, and they moved the green dot to Jefferson and then to Clark. Great. Makes sense. All right. Let's keep going here. So this is the dime from another look. So we got Clark here again in the middle of the field. And this is – Carr is now wearing number 39, but he took this back end roll. Kind of an interesting point here on the dime. Anthony Levine in 2018 had the greatest dime year, dime back year, of any dime in Ravens history. And uh, he's only got a couple of close competitors. Corey, Corey Harris in 2000 and Chad Williams in 2004 both had great years. But uh, Clark in 2019 is a very strong competitor for that greatest ever. I think you, you, you could certainly make the argument he was. And the Ravens played more dime snaps. Levine had a, lot more, had a few more big plays in 2018. But back here, you'll notice that Carr is playing strong safety uh, in this alignment. And the Ravens have too high. Uh, we'll go back to the previous one. You can see it. They have uh, you know, two deep safeties, a cover two look they're showing here. Uh, so effectively, Carr took Levine's spot uh, when Clark moved up into the box, and that stayed that way the rest of the year. They kept with Clark at the dime back roll and, uh, and Carr on the back end when they went to the dime package. Right. It really took away most of Levine's snaps for the back end for the second half of the season. So. That's right. He, he really only played quarter anymore. And, you know, I, I think it's a credit to, to Anthony that we never heard anything about him. He's a very vocal guy True. on Twitter. Talks a lot about this kind of stuff. And, you know, with the great year he had in 2018, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, that, 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 that he would lose his role. But they, they really they found a guy. You know, Jefferson had to kind of be in the same position. He was very good about understanding what the Ravens had to do in terms of of getting Clark. In fact, you know, you hear Thomas coming to this team and they go, why did they sign me? They had Chuck Clark already. They, they, right. I remember hearing that quote. That was a <laughs> very interesting take. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, I think great, great teammates, both of those guys, Jefferson, who was a, who's a fine player. Um, and, and also Levine, a great dime back and, and great special teamers that they're able to kind of, you know, put the team before their own playtime in, in a certain way and not, uh, not be vocal about what's going on. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's move on here. This is a version of the dime. We're going to look at three other versions of the dime here really quickly. This is a four cornerback dime. You rarely see this played. Now, the reason is the Arizona Cardinals, this is in week two, uh, are the most extreme 10 personnel team in the league. Now, 10 personnel, one running back, zero tight ends. That's what the 10 stands for. And it means you've got four wide receivers among your five eligible receivers. And they're split out here, and Martindale's game plan was just we will have four, four cornerbacks on the field, one on each of those four receivers um, for every time that they, uh, they, they bring that package on the field or essentially every time they bring that package on the field. So instead of having a third safety, which is the normal way to play the dime defense, they had four corners and two safeties. So here it's just Jefferson 
and Thomas on the back end. I want to show you just how extreme this, this thing was in terms of when they played it. Four corner dime here. They played 19 times against Arizona. They played two other times against Seattle, and that was it for the entire year. So 19 of 21 four corner dime snaps against Arizona. Uh, I thought one of the interesting things when I go through this is if I page down here, the All-22 view has as few players as you'll ever see in the All-22 view. You only can see, I think, 13 guys is what I counted, six defense and seven on offense. So uh, it's a Spartan uh, box, to say the least, that, uh, that is uh, here, and you, can, uh, you have all your players split wide of the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I thought this was a neat package because it really showed uh, an extreme version of the game planning that uh, that Martindale did, um, uh, you know, before the games, kind of understanding what packages that he would have, uh, what tools he would have, and uh, could match up against their uh, the the opponent best. So this was kind of an extreme version of it, but uh, but I think it worked out really well. So. Yeah, good point. I mean, Martindale did a lot of things that are very extreme and direct responses to what the opponent does. And I think Martindale probably deserves a lot of the credit for saying what we have on defense right now is not sufficient after week four. We've got to make changes. And it's not that it wouldn't have been apparent to anyone, but a defensive coordinator who had been strong, as Martindale is, might have said, you know, hey, look, we put it together last year in 2018. We can do it again with the personnel we have. There's no need to change. But I think he probably was one of the people saying, no, uh-uh, we got to change. We got to make changes. And, and this team has a fair number of weaknesses we need to address as quickly as possible. And then the fact that DaCosta was able to go to the street and find these guys with or without the approval of Martindale or Harbaugh, and I assume they had some say in it, uh, just very impressive. But uh, Martindale, both as an in-game and a strategic defensive coordinator, I think had a wonderful season. Yep, we'll see. Uh, don't know if we'll see much for cornerback dime for a couple of years until we yeah. see Arizona again. Yeah, you're right. So we don't play them again for four years. Hopefully there's no other team that, that comes into the league. Arizona shredded it pretty badly. This was a game where they had a lot of breakdowns on the back end in particular. Uh, Jefferson had quite a bad game in terms of being in the right place um, in this particular game. So happens to everyone, but uh, uh, too many Larry Fitzgerald wide open situations uh, in this game. All right, let's move on here, and we're going to a defense they hardly played at all here. This is a four safety dime. Uh, not common, and we won't spend a lot of time on it, but essentially Elliott is put in the game along with the standard three safeties who are Clark, um, uh, Jefferson, this is early in the year against, uh, looks like it's week four against the Browns, and Thomas. And uh, they're, they're doing this against a two tight end formation, so you really only need two cornerbacks and just another opportunity effectively to – um, have a good coverage unit out there with uh, with a couple tight ends on the field. It looks actually like the, the – yeah, two tight ends are lined up on this side. Um, and I can confirm that by going to the second view. Yep, so you have um, 86 and 88 over here, both uh, tight ends on that side. And uh, hopefully these two um, safeties who are in the box are going to be able to, to handle – take a portion of the coverage responsibility. Though Jefferson's also lined up to, to take that on this play. So uh, just a, a little bit of an oddball formation, not used heavily three times the entire season, but for completeness, we included it. Move on. Now, this is, this is what became the standard version of the dime down the stretch, and uh, this is the race car dime. Now, why does it make it? First of all, it's a dime because there's six defensive backs, and they're easy to separate in this case because everybody be inside the 40-yard line is a defensive back, starting with Chuck Clark here. And then all these five guys um, are not, and it consists of four outside linebackers and just one defensive lineman. And there is no inside linebacker, no true inside linebacker on this play, although Chuck Clark is up there in that dime back spot, which is effectively in the inside linebacker place. Now let's take a look at that real quickly. So you have, these numbers are not as readable here. I apologize for that, but we have, it looks like Judon over here. We have Bowser on this side. This is Ferguson right here in kind of a three-tech spot. And this is Ward in the other three-tech over here. And you have um, uh, Brandon Williams lining up directly over the nose as the only defensive lineman on the field. Um, 
They ran some race car packages, which we'll get to later, which had zero defensive linemen. But this particular package, in part because of having a big lead, the, the Rams had to pass to catch up. The Ravens just basically said, you want to run against us? Go ahead and run against us. But, you know, we're up 42 to six or 42 to whatever at, 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 at the time. And uh, uh, it, uh, let's see, I might have a problem here. Start video. Let's make sure I get, can you see my screen okay? Yep. Life is good. Okay. So they, basically the Ram, the, the Ravens dared the Rams to run the ball in this situation. Don't know if folks remember the Rams ran for 22 yards in this game. So that, that wasn't really a problem. Um, and they, they did a very good job of making golf nervous the entire night with this race car package. But in particular, they used it for all of the fourth quarter for the last 14 minutes of the fourth quarter anyway, uh, where they had the same package on the field. And, and they just basically said, look, you want to run, go ahead and run. If you look at some of the failures the Ravens did have against the run this year, some of them were edge setting problems like against San Francisco, against Cleveland. They had they certainly had very legitimate edge setting problems, but they also had some problems against Houston stopping the run late in the game. They had a 17 yard run and a 41 yard touchdown run in that year, in that game. So two runs for 58 that were basically just a case of the Ravens being in the dime defense with a big lead. And they said, go ahead and run. If you want, you're going to run for five yards, six yards. We don't care. And sure enough, the, the, the Texans break off a big one. And um, some of the Ravens decisions, Buffalo, again, this happened as well, decision to play dime defense kind of inflated some of the yards per carry stats for the opponents, uh, who at some point had to give up and just decide, let's see if we can have one good drive against this defense, given that we're down uh, in the game the way we are. All right. Anything, any questions on come up on this one, Dan? Let's see. I think, uh, you know, I think we saw that the race car started around week six and, uh, you know, a number of changes we talked about earlier. Um, but one of the big things was the addition of Jihad Ward uh, in week six that really um, added another outside linebacker rush threat um, that could make this, this package really work starting in week six. Yeah, they had they had McPhee before then. So mm -hmm. McPhee was available, and I forget which game he was hurt in, but I think it might have been Seattle fairly early. They actually played a five outside linebacker dime that I've included in this race car dime for at least one snap against Seattle. I think I'm forgetting if Ward was acquired in week five or six, but uh, but anyway, it's uh, I believe it otherwise was always a four um, outside linebacker package. But this is not a trivially used package this is 12.3 percent race car dime that's more than they played the base package guys for the entire season they played 17 more snaps of this race car dime and it's just a subset of dime packages than they did uh the base package and in fact the dime overall including the the couple smaller variants made up 38.3 percent of their defensive snaps toss in the quarter snaps which are another 3.9 you're at 42.1, 42.2 for the year. Um, that is by far the highest DB heavy package total the Ravens have ever used, meaning six and above. Um, the 2000 Ravens used 34.5% of dime and quarter snaps. And we know who the 2000 Ravens were, of course, in terms of their, their dominance. A lot of people look back at that defense and say, how did that happen? We, you know, I know who the base 11 players are. They were on the field all the time. Well, no, they weren't. You know, the th there's three guys you, you probably don't know of who were on the field a lot. And that's Corey Harris, Robert Bailey, and James Trapp, who were all pretty much NFL journeymen who were brought in to play these important nickel, dime, and quarter roles. And I think what that shows, and, and certainly what it shows also with this group here this year, is that your platoon players are very important to your most high leverage snaps. So you get them in there on your passing downs to stop third down conversions. They're very valuable. And uh, the defensive coordinators who can adapt to that, as Martindale you know, did very well this last year, as, as uh, Marvin Lewis did in 2000, are, are exceptionally successful at what they do. I would have thought the entire NFL would have changed after Marvin Lewis did in 2000, but that really wasn't uh, a universal change. A lot, of, a lot of teams still want to stay heavy, have two inside linebackers that were basically on the field all the time. And even the Ravens uh, you know, played less – uh, in all those years since, obviously, uh, since this is the this is the most ever over over 2000, um, you know, it's 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 strange. Even Marvin Lewis's teams in Cincinnati did not play nearly as much of this uh, DB heavy packages. 
so looking at this, um, would you, with the five guys on the line, would would you normally expect all five to rush, or um, or would one of them kind of drop back in this uh, the race car package? No, I kind of I kind of missed that. They could rush, and they could rush seven. They could rush even eight. On, right. out of, certainly out of this formation, but a more common uh, thing to do is that they want to disguise where the rush is coming from, and the flexibility of Judon and Bowser is one of the real strengths of this defense. Um, the Ravens effectively put two Sam linebackers on the field, two guys who can really drop to cover seamlessly, both of them very good. They're both in the top tier, I would say, of NFL coverage linebackers, and they're both able – outside linebackers – and they're both able to drop uh, uh, simply. And that gives you a lot of different ways you can rush the quarterback to try and find overloads or find a free runner. And particularly on third and medium – very important in the NFL to get a free runner for a fast pressure that gets the quarterback flustered, gets him throwing the ball away, hopefully, or gets him just throwing inaccurately um, because he's pressured. But you, you want to get a fast pressure even more so on these, uh, on these third and medium plays. So I think this is a very effective defense uh, for that. All right. So let's move on here if we can. The quarter defense I have, I picked this one because the, uh, the Ravens played it a fair amount in this game against the Texans. Um, you can't really see what's going on here. You can see the umbrella here has five players, but it's not exactly clear what's going on at the line of scrimmage. So we'll go to the uh, all 22 view from here, from the end zone. And you'll see that Levine is up here in the A gap. And it's not because he would take on that center every play. He's just, uh, he's just up in there A gap, at least simulating pressure. And Clark looks like he might be more likely to actually blitz because He's standing over Ricard, perhaps trying to take advantage of how Ricard uh, turns the shoulders of the garden tackle on this side. So um, interesting choice by, by Clark. But he, I don't know if he actually blitzed on this play, but it certainly looks like he might be. And uh, you still have the opportunity. This is a little bit odd play because we have Fergus on the outside, uh, which he can play certainly, but we have Bowser on the inside, which is a little strange. That's not the normal play. So he could certainly drop to cover from this spot. Um, this could be a all way go on this side where you have four guys rushing from this side because you have the possibility to have just Ward come on this side and maybe even Bowser and Levine both drop to, uh, to coverage to provide some uh, flexibility for the rush there. So there's a lot of different ways they can approach this. Deshaun Watson, by the way, had a lot of trouble with this defense um, all, all the way, the quarter defense, but, but all the, the Ravens pass rush packages. Did a great job of containing him, not necessarily delivering quick pressure, but when Watson is in the pocket and feels kind of that Star Wars trash compactor. Um, by the way, Dan, let me ask you, Star Wars trash compactor, does that elicit any sort of a thought in your mind? Nope. Okay. The younger guy here, I, I, I thought this might be a problem. So uh, <laughs> the Star Wars trash compactor scene is from the original movie, which came out in 1977, is obviously a little bit dating me, but they get in a trash compactor and they're having to basically call up the robots or whatever they're doing to try and get them to stop the trash compactors from closing on them very, very slowly. It's almost like gotcha. being in a J James Bond trap or something, but, uh, but, but he would, he would feel the, the pocket compressing on him slowly and, and Deshaun Watson would take his eyes off the field and they, they sacked him seven times in this game, largely because he was running around the pocket when the pocket was fairly clean, honestly, in terms of uh, his ability to do so, but he wasn't able to reacquire the field very well. Um, that's something that, that I think we saw at a Jackson at a much higher level in this last year. So it's, it's really nice to see one of the other good young quarterbacks in the league struggle at something that your quarterback's very good at. Okay, so quarter, quarter defense here, seven defensive backs. In this case, it's done with three outside linebackers and one defensive lineman in there with Ricard. All right, I got one more example. This is a race car quarter. They played it against Cincinnati. Let's take a look at it right here. You don't see too much different here, but when, one thing you will notice is this is Ward now here, along with McPhee and Bowser and Judon more in their normal Sam roles on the outside there. Um, and the, while they're showing a simulating a bridge with, blitz with six men at the line of scrimmage, they don't have a single defensive lineman in here. So this is purely for pass rush, and, uh, and they're going get to get after Dalton somehow uh, – from this, but uh, they didn't use the race car dime all that often. Sorry, the race car quarter all that often. I believe only nine times the whole season. There it is in line 16 here. So it's not like it was a fairly commonly used package, but, uh, but it was fairly effective when they did it. And they had 3.9% uh, total quarter. You can see about 
25% uh, of their total race car, or of quarter snaps were of the race car variety. So that takes us to the end of this. Let's go back to where we were in terms of the pictures. Um, oh, I got one more defense. This is a jumbo defense. It's a goal line defense. Um, you don't want to be in this defense very often if you can help it, but we got four guys that are down here in the middle that are all defensive linemen. So this is the only package that includes four pure defensive linemen on the field at the same time. And then you'll also notice there's two other down players. In this case, it's Ferguson and McPhee uh, in week four who are down. And that's typical. You'd have six guys down the line of scrimmage. I always say low man wins. If you ever go to practice, you'll see Harbaugh getting on somebody, he usually picks on somebody specifically, who he doesn't think is quite low enough on the defense and he goes after him. I remember him doing it to Urban, and Urban is a huge guy, and you know, like, how low can he possibly get? You know, right. I think he's asking the tallest guy to limbo effectively. But the, the, the offensive lineman will often try and uh, you know just get that player upright because then they can move him. The defensive player will often try and submarine and create a pile that makes it more difficult for the running running back to negotiate that gap and then allow those linebackers to try and make the play. Uh, the way the rest of this defense is kind of interesting, I thought, set up. You have, you have two other safeties who are flanking the edge of the line of scrimmage. They may be forced into a coverage responsibility. If it's the run, they have to contain the edge um, that way as well. Normally, there might be a third safety in past years. Uh, Marlon Humphrey is a big physical corner, so they kept him on the field for these uh, downs as, a, uh, as the one primary coverage player if they run only a one-man route. So he would have either – um, one of these two tight ends or potentially the running back, probably one of these two tight ends on a fade route or, or something else they might run. Uh, these two linebackers, you'll notice on this side of the line of scrimmage, um, are aligned differently in terms of their feet than they would be normally. So if we go back to another package, let's say we go back to, oops, uh, Maureen, we, we ruined, you ruined your specific thing. Let's go to back, back to a, kind of a base package here. See how the feet of the inside linebackers are even? Well, they're, they're not sure where they have to be, so they're trying to maintain their leverage so that they can go in either direction. And we'll go forward again to where we were on the goal line. Um, these guys are ready to pounce. So they're looking to be in almost a sprinter stance to come in and dive into a gap and try and meet that, um, that running back uh, at a spot where, where uh, uh, they can keep them out of the end zone. Uh, another different look view of it here and not a whole lot of difference. This is just a little bit later. You see Humphrey following. Um, I think it's seals. I'm not actually sure who that is. It might be seals Jones motion here. All right. Anything else about that, Dan? Nope. I think you covered it. All right. Very good. All right. One other person I want to, I want to really make sure gets her due on this. This is Maureen, my wife. We had a very rainy year in Baltimore for games. We went to a lot of games where just an utter downpour. Maureen very, very kindly records the defensive backs in for every play while we're at the game. Uh, the reason we do that is because it's hard for me to get that off the broadcast video. I can, I can check it again on the, um, on the uh, coaches film when that comes out. But, I, but until then, um, this is by far the best source I have. And uh, Maureen does that and she scores it inside a plastic bag when we've had these rainy days. But she also does a lot of other things with data entry, making notes and whatnot. I could not do what I do without her. And I want to make sure she got her props in, uh, in this. Uh, uh, presentation. Anyway, I uh, appreciate uh, you having you on too, Dan. Uh, anything else we want to talk about before we get off? Any overarching comments you'd like to make? No, I just, uh, I just really... I think it's great the versatility that this defense has and allows it to work through all these formations and, and really put a put a big challenge on, on the against the offense. So it's uh it's always a, a, a fun fun thing to watch. So yeah, it's it's been very entertaining. Martindale's is just a master of other things we didn't talk about, snap count. I mean, he's been just wonderful at managing snaps. And now the Ravens are acquiring a couple older guys, you know, in, in Wolf and Calais Campbell, who both are going to need some management of snap count, presumably. And, and they, they could not be in better hands than they are right yep. now. Yeah, it's exciting to see what they'll do. All right, Dan, much appreciate having you on, my friend. And, and uh, tell us again, where, where can they find you on Twitter? Because that's really the place where I think that uh, folks are going to be most likely to uh, – 
Yeah, just Go reach on out to me on, on Twitter. Uh, it's it's DP Reese, uh, R E E S. So DP Reese and then the number eight. All right. I uh, promise you have some good feel, football discussion if you do, and make sure you, you jump in. Don't, don't feel ashamed or don't, uh, don't be shy about tagging either Dan or me. I'm at Film Study Ravens. Uh, if you want to get a, a conversation about football going, there's always a lot of people uh, who will jump in on that. Uh, so really appreciate you being here, Dan, and uh, uh, thanks for talking with us today. Yeah, it was great. Thanks, guys. Josh, how about you? Uh, new session 336. We all missed opening day last week for baseball season. So uh new episode of 336 just came out this evening where we talk with Jeff Arnold, which is who is the new voice of the Baltimore Orioles. So he's on the radio broadcast mostly, a little bit of TV. Used to be a Frederick Keys, longtime friend of the show. So it was good to catch up with him and talk about his new role now with the Orioles. That's great promotion from within. You know, I remember a few years ago when they uh they got the new PA announcer, but that's terrific that they that they promote from within for a job like that. Yeah, I don't think they look to do it from within, but it happened to work out this time. And it's perfect timing because he's the right guy because he's been watching all these guys go through single A that are going to be coming up in the next few years and actually be good for a team. So it'll be great to have him with that perspective. And, and it's a single A to the majors jump, though. No, no, no. So – He's going single A to the majors. The players are going to have to go through their no, no. progression. I, I, I'm really talking the announcer. I have a broadcasting background. I'm going to tell you that single A to the majors oh, yeah. is an enormous leap for a broadcaster. Yes. I mean, it's just an enormous leap. The, in fact, there's, so, there's such a paucity of scarcity of, of jobs for baseball announcers. I, I wanted to do this originally. This is what I wanted to do. It's what I went away to school to do was to be a baseball play-by-play guy. And there's such a, the, the one guy who had the best chance to do it in my class was a guy named Dan Horde, who is, is now the voice of the Bengals. And he has done, he has bent over backwards to try and get a baseball job, in, including commuting to Pawtucket to do their games where, where they are really thought of as the next step from a major league jobs for a lot of, for a lot of people. So okay. that's, that's a fantastic jump for this guy. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. And he does, it's because he's very talented. He's good at what he does. So it, it's exciting. I heard him call a few spring training games. I've heard him on many keys broadcasts. So I'm excited for him. All right. Well, great job, Mr. Arnold. Congratulations. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you. Yeah. And then uh, another film study podcast this week. Yeah. Derek Wolf. It'll be, uh, it'll be uh, very soon, but, uh, but we do not have it yet scheduled and uh, we'll get right on that. All right, guys. We'll have a great weekend. Ken, thanks for the breakdowns.